Hi everybody, this is Susan, the Education Manager at the Sacramento History Museum. Now, on a normal March day, I would be at the museum welcoming in uh, students so that they could come to their field trip at the museum and uh, learn about the history of their, their city and their region and the people who make it up. But of course, none of us can be at the museum right now, so we thought we would try and bring the museum to you. Um, this week, we're going to focus on our program called Head West that talks about the motivations behind why people wanted to move west and how they made it there and how long the journey is and the sort of things that you might need to pack if you were um, taking that journey um, back then. Now this journey is actually before the California Gold Rush, so it's before 1849. Next week we will be learning more about the Gold Rush. So this is kind of the people that came first and, and what their journey was like. So let's get started. When we talk about heading west, it's important to kind of tell what our country looked like at the time that people really started to move west. So of course in green over here, we've got the east coast with all of the more settled states. Those are the 13 original colonies that we're all very used to, but people didn't really know what was out west and especially west of the Mississippi River, which is this river here. It's a squiggly line. And part of the reason was because it didn't belong to the United States, but that changed in 1803 when and President Thomas Jefferson bought this whole yellow part here called the Louisiana Purchase. And he ended up sending two explorers, perhaps you've heard of them. We've got Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. And he sent these explorers to that area, to the yellow area, and to the Oregon country or the, the orange area off to the west. And they were kind of tasked with making maps and just figuring out what was over there. And they did a great job of it. You can actually see their line right here. They did make it to the Pacific Ocean and they made it back to kind of tell what the land was like out there. So following Lewis and Clark's exploration of the West and the, the Louisiana Purchase, there was this great desire to expand the United States from coast to coast. And this was actually called Manifest Destiny. Now, during the 1840s was when a lot of people actually um, started to, to move out west in particular. And one of these places that pioneers settled was California, right here. But again, we had another big problem. California did belong to the United States, just like the Louisiana Purchase. This area didn't originally belong to the United States. So tensions between the American settlers who were moving west and the Mexican government came to a head in um, the 1840s and started the Mexican-American War. When the war ended and a treaty was signed, California ended up becoming the 31st state of the United States. It was under President Polk's presidency <laughs> that the United States expanded from coast to coast, just like he was hoping to go from sea to shining sea was his big, was his big ideal. When people started heading west, they would leave from Missouri, usually. That was kind of the last spot where it was more settled. You could get a lot of your supplies. You could meet up with people who were also traveling west and kind of have strength in numbers, create a wagon train that you could travel together with. And at first, in the 1840s in particular, people were headed out to Oregon, out here. And, and then, of course, that kind of switched in 1849 with the gold rush, a lot more people started heading to California instead. But as you can see, there's actually a lot of trails, a lot of options that people would take. It wasn't just the Oregon Trail. It wasn't just the California Trail. People were heading all over the place. But there's a big problem, right? They are leaving from Independence, Missouri, right here, and they're headed west to Oregon City or to Sacramento. But they didn't have these things that we call GPS, <laughs> right? And they didn't have nice maps and they didn't have any way to, even, even roads to, to know how to get out west. So how did people travel back then? Or how did they know how to get the way? They're really dependent on things like The Immigrant's Guide to Oregon and California, a book that showed people the way based off of a path that somebody had already taken. Now this one in particular, you can see it was the 1845 Pioneer's Guide. 
Uh, this one was written by a gay, guy named Lansford Hastings, who was just one man on horseback, and he decided to go from Independence, he came up all the way down to S Salt Lake City, and then cut across here on this way, and he ended up going, he wanted to do, he said this would save a lot of time as opposed to going up and over. You would save so much time by doing this path instead. But he didn't actually do that path himself. He just kind of looked at a map and said, oh yeah, you'd save a lot of time. And so one party in particular did this one. Perhaps you've heard of them. They're called the Donner Party. And they decided that, yeah, they didn't want to, they wanted to save time and they were going to go this way. But of course, this ended up bringing them through salt flats where there was no fresh water. It ended up taking them a lot longer to get to California. And by the time they reached California in the Sierras, the snow had already started to fall and they got stuck in the Sierras for a long time. So even though they had a guidebook and they were doing these things that they thought was right, it doesn't necessarily mean that the guidebooks were 100% accurate, unfortunately. Now, a lot of people actually met up with others who were leaving to head west and created a wagon train. Now, this picture here is, is of course, a, a recreation, and there is one thing about it that bothers me, and it's these really pretty looking horses here. They wouldn't have used horses. They absolutely would have used oxen instead, because your journey is going to take you between four and six months if everything goes right. So if you left on April 1st, you're not going to arrive to your destination, whether it be Oregon or California or Santa Fe or wherever, until at least August, if not October. And again, that's if everything goes right. So you would have wanted really strong horses that can go over all of this terrain, the mountains the plains, the, the, the deserts, everything, and could carry all of your belongings. So you would have had a much stronger animal, an oxen. Now let's look at the wagon itself. The wagon wouldn't have been more than four feet by eight feet. That's not that long. If you actually have a, a yardstick or a tape measure, try and put that out on the ground just to see how much space you, you would really have. And think about it again, your journey is four to six months and there's not just you know places that you can stop and, and get more food and, and supplies. So you have to try and pack as much as you need uh, for your trip. And so what are some of the things that they would have brought? Now, there are things that you can find along the way, of course. You can go hunting, maybe, and, and, and find food that way. But you need some really tough stuff. So you would pack some cooking utensils. Maybe you have this in your kitchen. This is a cast iron skillet. If you drop this on the trail because it's bumpy or something, not a big deal. It's going to survive anything. And you can put it over an open fire because you're not stopping at a hotel to, to uh, every night to eat. You're putting this right over an open fire. You would also want food that's going to last a long time. So a lot of the things that we have in our fridge, for example, are perishable. They're just not going to last that long. So what you would want is food that you can can or jar and will last you a long time. Like this, these examples here, I see um, you know, pickles and, and all sorts of fruits that you can definitely can and, and bring along with you. And of course, you won't want to forget uh, a variety of tools that you may need along the way, because if your wagon wheel breaks, for example, there's not just a wagon wheel on the side of the, the, the path that you can use. You're going to have to fix it yourself. And so you have to bring the, the tools that you think you'll need, not just for your journey, but also when you arrive, you might have to build your own house or, or uh, you know, use your tools then as well. Now think about also the journey. You're traveling through literally half of the country and you start out of Missouri and the whole first part of that traveling looks kind of like this. You've got the Great Plains that you're going through. It's Nebraska, right? And that's what Nebraska looks like. There's not a lot out there. So even think about when you're trying to cook over your open fire, where are you getting your, your wood or, or whatever you might need to, to build that fire? It just doesn't exist out there. So you have to be creative. People would have used buffalo chips, if you know what that is, which is 
it's it's dried buffalo poop. <laughs> and the, the kids actually would have been the ones in charge of going and finding these materials and using them or and using them for um, for the fires. So think about that too. Yes, you can maybe burn the grass a little bit, but that's not going to last you long enough to, to make a whole meal. So you would get past the plains and then you're running into the Rocky Mountains, which looks so different. You've got your forests and then you've got your mountains and your wagon has to go through all that. So remember, you have your oxen too that's kind of pulling you along, but the journey is really difficult. And again, it's assuming that you've got good weather. So just kind of think about the hardships that people really had to go through when they were traveling back then. We're so lucky that we live when we do today. And of course, there are deserts and salt flats like these. This is what the poor Donner Party came up against before they ever made it to California. There's no fresh water around there. Hopefully along the way you've been gathering water. But boy, if you ran into something like this, it's going to be it's going to be really difficult. So why did people make this journey? It's so hard and it can be really desolate and you might not make it all the way or you might stop and, and decide, you know what, I've gone far enough or, you know, other tragedies might happen to you. So why did people decide to go? What was, you know, the thing behind it? And you kind of have to think about what life was like back then. People maybe had, um, they needed a chance to go and, and make a new life somewhere else. And so they wanted to journey and make a better life for their family. We still do that today. People get new jobs and move for their jobs. Or maybe they had a sense of adventure and just thought, oh, I have to see what's out there. No one knew, right? Remember Lewis and Clark were the first ones to really try and map out what was West. So there's a lot of motivations that were leading people out West and trying to, to, to move out there and to get out there. Now, that's kind of all we have for you today for our Head West. Look at some of the activities that we have. Have fun with them. Play with them. Think about why people wanted to move west. What was the motivation behind it? And next week, we'll talk about a big motivation that happened in 1849, which is gold. But also, um, before we talk about the gold rush, we're going to talk about another way that people traveled west. And that was by sea. So what we just talked about was the overland routes. That was all by covered wagon or by horse going across the land. But we'll also discuss how people could get to the west on a ship. So stay tuned for that later um, and we'll be back. Music